3. Today we've been working to insert OpenStreetMap data into PostGIS. There's a really useful article on, um, let me skip that, on JISPO website, where they kind of give us an overview of all the options. And uh, here it is, importing spatial data into PostGIS. Uh, we sort of reviewed these options here. Uh, a lot of them uh, will either rely on a command line utility or something similar. Um, I wanted to keep this, or a graphical user interface. I wanted to keep this all in Python. So our goal here would be to automate the process on a server on a daily or weekly basis. And we're already using Python and Django, so we might as well keep things kind of in the same language family. Um, what we've got here is we're using GeoPandas and SQL Alchemy. And we create a SQL Alchemy engine. I've got Postgres running. In our last um, session, we created a Docker Compose file to run Postgres SQL uh, locally so we could spin it up and tear it down uh, while persisting the data um, without having to have it running on my local development machine all the time. So we connect to that. And I had a few options, but essentially what I've done is downloaded the data to a directory. It's a bunch of shape files. And these come from uh, GeoFabric. Um, there's also several ways of obtaining OpenStreetMap data of various degrees of abstraction. Um, there's even a way to directly query it using OSM NX, which we've used in a previous session. I think the GeoFabric provides a good uh, compromise. It, has, it offers things in shapefile format, and it separates them out into some interesting layers that I th think are natural ways of uh, uh, conceiving or conceptualizing the data, like land use, natural features, places of worship, places of interest, rails and roadways, water features. So, whereas if we just do a raw OSM dump, uh, we're just going to get things abstracted in a way that's, uh, or like less than abstracted, it's uh, structured in a way that's useful for OpenStreetMap and rendering a s static uh, slippy map. Um, it's useful for styling it and rendering those uh, two dimensional data, but it's not going to give us um, more natural concepts to work with. And I think also an issue is the topology is not preserved, which we might have to come to later. In any case, we've downloaded these data files here. And I rather than implicitly using like the file name and splitting it out and creating a table name based on the file name or something like that, uh, I just went with explicit is better than implicit. I created a, a little bit verbose, but in any, in any case, it's a file name, file path to table mapping. So um, it gives it a little bit more meaningful name, easier to interpret when we get it into uh, the database. And I'm not going to run this next code, uh, this next uh, thing on the server. It takes just for importing two um, fairly large layers, it took a couple of minutes, and I maxed out my memory. You can see I'm profiling the RAM here. Um, I have to figure out uh, why uh, the garbage collector is not kind of cleaning up uh, after the fact, but in any case, uh, I, I learned a valuable lesson again to work in small batches or chunks. So I'll read this code real quick. We This is a cell magic that just says time this cell, see how long it takes. And I created that table map again. It's just dictionaries with a file path and a table name. And for each of those, we're going to open the geodata frame, open the shapefile into a geodata frame. And each of those shapefiles, uh, each of the items has an op OSM ID value. And uh, rather than using just some arbitrary data frame index, we're just going to use the OpenStreetMap ID. Um, so I kind of did that in place here. There's a, I, that also could have been done here uh, during the insert. But in the final thing, there's a new-ish, uh, as of May, method on the geo data frames to post GIS. This actually took me an hour <laughs> to arrive at this conclusion. And really, if I had just read this just both article a little bit closer, they had mentioned it among these other sources. So thank you, just
uh, for providing this uh, information and specifically they re they even pointed here that geopandas now has this new method i just went the long way to get back to that same point and essentially it's using the same uh, arguments uh, as the pandas to sql um, method which i was originally trying but had great difficulty with the geometry column this post gis handles that for us Underneath things, it's using GeoAlchemy 2 and uh, PsychoPG2, uh, as well as SQLAlchemy 2. We give it a reference to our connection in, uh, engine defined up here. And we are inside of a loop, so we just say the table name is going to be the item table name. And here I'm not worried about preserving the old data, and in fact, we probably won't be if we're just updating on a batch process. We would replace those tables. And the key uh, thing is, by default, this will create a single SQL statement for the whole data frame, uh, which I think on most cases is probably gonna be fairly excessive, but in particular with these um, geodata frames and these geometry columns that can be, uh, you know, hundreds of hundreds of points with varying degrees of decimal accuracy. This is a huge SQL statement and there's like something like 300,000 rows. And essentially it, it took all my computer memory. I was kind of figuring out why. So the solution so far has been to chunk it into 100 rows at a time and then insert that. And it worked a couple of minutes. So yeah, it's one of those things. Have a cup of tea while you wait for it. Uh, I'm gonna test this out further off the stream and clean up the notebook um, but as long as my computer doesn't totally uh, crash the kernel the python kernel it does f safely bail out before uh, the computer kind of stalls with with no memory um, as long as things work i think this will be uh, a reasonable stopping point and by default i think ubuntu is already using four gigs of my memory so this could run on a, an ubuntu server instance for example uh, with maybe uh, only using about four to six gigabytes depending on how well it's optimized. If it doesn't work, I'll back to the drawing board and I'll, I'll probably use one of those command line utilities. All right, well, this has been quite a learning journey today, learning experience today, and we're getting closer to being able to display some um, specific urban data on a slippy map um, under our control, displaying things for analytical purposes such as food sources and creating buffers around those food sources. The pieces are coming in to the picture. It's just each um, step of the way has got its own unique challenges. And I've repeated this uh, on the stream, but we're trying to solve these challenges, overcome these challenges so that we can create a nice abstraction so that urban planners and, and activists and community advocates can just think in terms of how they'd like their communities to be organized, what they'd like to improve, and not have to worry about the whole supporting layer of spatial data infrastructure, data types, um, you know, databases, all this kind of stuff that throws us, uh, you know, six different ways every time we work with it. It's interesting, don't get me wrong, and I, I'm really grateful for the level of um, capability that the Python ecosystem has and that people are building around these um, to projects like OpenStreetMap and communities like OpenStreetMap, but at the same time, I just recognize there's a huge need to make things much simpler and bring these tools to bear on really important issues. That's just you know sustainability and sustainable urban design, which is a, of paramount importance for our generation and future generations. Cool. So this has been a CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. If you'd like to get involved with this project, stop by github.com slash sustainable urban design. CodeBuddies is a great community to get involved with this and similar projects. There's all sorts of study groups and hangouts going on on a daily basis, and CodeBuddies platform itself is open source. You can stop by github.com slash CodeBuddies or the CodeBuddies front page to get involved with that project. I appreciate everybody's time. I hope you're doing well out there and stay healthy.